Hey everyone, and welcome to tutorial number six. In this video, I'll talk about iteration and how it can be used for audio synthesis. Iteration is a topic in and of itself, but essentially, iteration is a repeating process. It enables the user to execute a block of code many times over, usually until some condition is met or a certain number of iterations have been performed. It's very common to iterate over a collection of items, and by this I mean you take a collection and one by one pass the individual items into a function as input arguments. In the class library there's an object called collection, which is the parent of many useful subclasses, listed here at the top. There's also a file called collections that outlines the subclass hierarchy. One of these subclasses is array, which we're already sort of familiar with. Back in the collection help file, we can do a search for the word iteration, which takes us to a list of relevant methods. There are actually quite a few, but the most generalized method is called do, which simply evaluates a function for each item in the collection. To iterate over a collection, we first need to create a collection. So here's an array of several numbers, and to iterate over this array, we'll send it the message do and provide a function. I'll keep things fairly simple and just print hello for each iteration. Because there are five items in the array, we see the word hello five times. We also see the original array in the post window, and this is because do always returns its receiver. Uh, this is usually irrelevant, and it's probably best to ignore this or just think of it as a side effect of using do. More importantly, you might have noticed that the same result would have been produced from an array of any five items, so this is not a particularly instructive example. In many cases, you'll want to incorporate somehow the collection's items into the function. Uh, for example, if you have a list of 200 file names, you might want to change the extension on all of these file names. And this is where the real strength of iteration comes into play. To pass items into a function, we declare an input argument whose value will range over the contents of the collection. In this particular function, we're going to square each item and post the result. In some cases, you might also want to keep track of how many times the function has been evaluated, uh, or in other words, how many iterations have occurred. This is done by adding a second argument to the function, like this. Now, uh, on each iteration, I'll instead post an array containing the current number of iterations and the current item, squared. You might notice that we're not actually storing the results of this data manipulation anywhere, we're just posting information. Using do, if you'd actually like to return and store a modified collection, you'd have to change this array explicitly within the function. First, it's probably a good idea to create a new empty array to hold our resulting calculations, since uh, it's generally risky and perhaps undesirable to overwrite data. The function squares every item in the array and stores each result at the corresponding index in the array x. The last evaluated statement in this clump of code is a do statement, which, as we've seen, returns its receiver. But sure enough, if we query the global variable x, we can see that it is the collection of our new data. But do isn't the best method to use for something like this. It's much easier to use a method called collect, which returns a new collection instead of just returning its receiver. While we've explicitly stored new data in the function above, collect does this automatically, so all we'd have to do is type this. And for anyone out there who has a sweet tooth for syntactic sugar, you can even use this condensed underscore notation. One more thing before we move on to audio. I'll point out that positive integers respond to do by iterating from zero up to and not including their value. So something like 5.do is effectively the same as the array 0 through 4.do. And just to prove this, I'll iterate over the array and post each item, and then execute 5.do and post each item. We're using different receivers, but the results of these two functions are indistinguishable. So now let's move on to iterative synthesis in order to see how we can use do with ugens. Consider, for instance, this simple variable duty sawtooth wave. It's nice, but, uh, you know, it's not particularly interesting or anything. But with iteration, we can layer many of these sounds together to create something much richer. In the following synthdef, I'll declare two variables, temp and sum, 
temp will be used within the iteration block to hold a temporary signal, and sum will be the eventual output signal. So to start, I'll initialize sum to 0. Within the iteration block, which will be evaluated 10 times, I'll create an audio rate var saw, but I'll randomize the frequency a little bit. The second argument is the phase, and the third argument is the duty cycle. Then I'll add this signal to the output signal and store the result. So what will happen here is that this function will be evaluated 10 times, and on each iteration we create a stereo var saw whose frequency is slightly and uniquely offset from 40 Hz. And then we add this signal to a running total. By the end, we've accumulated 10 unique sawtooth waves summed together. Because of this, it's a good idea to scale down this signal, since it's probably going to clip. And last but not least, we need an output eugen. Before we dive into this example, I just want to point out what happens if we don't initialize our sum variable. Without a starting value, sum is equal to nil, which is a special value given to variables that don't have a value. SuperCollider doesn't know how to add things to nil, and quite frankly, it doesn't make sense to me either, so uh, it runs into trouble on this line. Sure enough, SuperCollider tells us, in the error message, that it couldn't make heads or tails of the plus operator. So that's why we need to initialize the output signal. Right off the bat, this sounds a lot more interesting than the single Varsa. Uh, but as you might have heard, there's a huge pop at the beginning of this sound. And it's pretty ugly. Uh, and that's because all these varsaws have the same initial phase offset, zero. So if we randomize the phase as well, we can smooth out the sound a bit. And, you know, while we're at it, we could randomize the duty cycle as well. I'm going to throw a done action too on this synthdef so that I don't have to worry about freeing these synths anymore. I'll add a frequency argument so that now we can specify any frequency we like when we instantiate or change the synth. If you prefer, you can deal in MIDI note numbers using the conversion method MIDI CPS. And hey, get this, we can even use iteration again to generate multiple synths at the same time. Although, to be honest, I would generally not recommend using language-side looping and iteration, such as do, to create simultaneous synths, since you run the risk of losing sample accuracy if you're using a lot of complicated or heavy-duty eugens. But as you heard, even if these four synths aren't technically simultaneous down to the sample level, it still sounds pretty damn close. Here is another example. Unlike the previous synthdef, this time, I'll actually incorporate the iteration count into the audio manipulation. So I'll define an argument within the iteration block. I'll call it count. Notice that I don't actually need a second argument for the iteration count, because when using integer.do, the items in the collection and the iteration count are actually the same stream of numbers. So using two arguments is actually redundant. I'll create an overtone of a fundamental pitch by multiplying the frequency by the iteration count. I have to add 1 because the iteration count starts at 0, and we don't want an oscillator with a frequency of 0 Hz. The rest of the example is no different from the previous example. What we hear is a stack of 10 partials with a fundamental of 200 Hz. Now, granted, there's already a eugen that does this, called blip, 
But with iteration, we have a lot more control over the individual partials than we do with blip. For instance, we can have the frequency of each overtone meander very slightly using LF Noise 1. I'll also invoke multi-channel expansion on LF Noise 1 so that we have two unique channels of audio. We can add another statement within the iteration block to have the amplitude of each partial fluctuate randomly. And don't forget that we can change the frequency since we have declared an argument for it. Maybe you'd want to control the amount of frequency deviation in addition to frequency. So we can declare an argument and then set the range of LF noise 1 with the help of the reciprocal method, like this. Here's a problem you might run into. Let's say we want even more partials. One natural instinct is to replace the integer receiver of do with an argument so that we could theoretically change it just like we change the frequency or frequency deviation. But this doesn't work, as you can hear from this strange result, and I'll tell you why. The reason is that the receiver of do is no longer an integer. It sure looks like an integer, but it's not. It's actually an instance of a class called control, which is a type of eugen that SuperCollider creates automatically whenever you declare an argument in a synthdef. The key fact is that control is not a collection. It's just one thing. So when we iterate over a control, the control just passes itself into the function once. Uh, in this case, the actual output value of the signal is the default value 10. So 10 plus 1 is multiplied by the fundamental frequency, 200 hertz, and then there's some slight frequency deviation. So what we end up hearing is basically just a 2.2 kilohertz tone. Just to prove this, I'll start up the sound again, and uh, I'll set the argument num equal to some different floating point values, just to show that it serves no other purpose than as a frequency multiplier. So uh, in that example, there's really no iteration happening at all. Changing the number of iterations in a synthdef in real time essentially boils down to changing the code in a synthdef in real time, which, from what I understand about how SuperCollider is designed, is pretty much impossible. So the best way to change the number of partials, or the number of iterations in a synthdef, is to just manually change the iteration receiver, and then reevaluate the synthdef. That's it for tutorial number six. If you'd like to see more, I've got an older video on this channel that deals with creating an infinite reverb effect, which also includes some synthdef iteration. In the next video, I'll talk about the architecture of the audio server in more detail. Thanks for watching this tutorial, and see you next time.